Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Come on in and take a seat if, you are, uh, if you're able to do that, and we'll get started. Uh, hopefully, before you come in, if you uh, grab a bulletin, um, because on there are a number of announcements. I want to go through a couple of those, uh, couple of those things. Uh, so take a look at the, uh, take a look at the back. Um, first, and this is just uh, you know, mainly FYI, we've had some good, uh, good reaction from people being willing to volunteer, but we do this four or five times a year at different events and things that are going on in our community where we will take a tent, we'll take some goodies, some refreshments, and be a part of something that our community is doing. Well, we're going to do that uh, this coming Saturday, April 1st. Wall Township is hosting their annual Easter egg hunt over at the Municipal Building. Um, and so we're going to be there, and we're going to hand out cookies, and we're going to hand out uh, invitations to come and join us on Easter, and we're just generally going to be a good neighbor uh, because we believe that's what the Bible uh, calls us to, to do. And so, uh, so pray for us. Uh, if you have little kids or neighbors and want to come to the egg hunt, uh, it's free. You don't need to register or anything like that. It's just over at the Wall Municipal Complex. Um, if you're interested in volunteering and you haven't contacted us, then uh, the more the merrier. It's always good to have, uh, have folks uh, uh, with us when we do those kinds of things. Um, secondly, um, there is a fellowship lunch next Sunday, the first Sunday of the month. We'll be celebrating the, uh, the Lord's Supper together in the service, and then following that, we'll have a meal together downstairs. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer uh, for that lunch. Now, uh, anyone is welcome to come. It's not a sign-up sheet to, to come, um, but we need food. Uh, to help, uh, to help uh, you know, sort of spread the, spread the table. So there's sign-up list. It's really simple. We're just do soups, salads, desserts. Um, but if you are able and you're planning on coming and you're able to kind of prep uh, something to bring, uh, then that's always a great, a great help. And so there's a sign-up sheet that helps us to sort of plan uh, what to expect. So uh, please, if you're able, uh, sign up to, to help with that. Um, speaking of, uh, of sign-ups and, and food, on Easter Sunday, April the 7th, um, I'm sorry, uh, April the 9th is Easter Sunday. We'll have a Good Friday service on, on the 7th here at 7 o'clock. Um, but on Easter morning, prior to our service uh, at 10, uh, we'll have a, a sort of a, a fellowship Easter breakfast at 9. So no regular Sunday school that morning, uh, but we're going to have sort of a, just a community Easter breakfast downstairs in our, uh, our fellowship room. Um, there again, there is a sign-up sheet. Actually, there's two sign-up sheets there. There, there is a sign-up sheet uh, if you're able to, if you're interested in coming, this just gives us a, a, an idea of how many people to expect. Um, and there's a sign-up sheet to be able to bring stuff to the to the breakfast. So if you're able to, please sign up for that. That's now I'm talking about Easter Sunday. Um, now speaking of speaking of Easter, uh, every year for the last couple of years at Easter, we have collected a special offering that we call the Easter Hope Offering. Uh, there is no time of year in the Christian calendar and what we celebrate uh, that is more filled with hope in the midst of brokenness than Easter. Um, and so every year, our elders designate a specific ministry uh, that is speaking hope into the brokenness of this world and says, you know what, we're going to collect a special offering uh, through the Easter season that we're going to give to them. This year, uh, what we have decided to designate is a ministry called Love Link uh, in El Salvador. Uh, some of you may have been uh, able to come to, we had a breakfast with uh, the, the director of that ministry uh, last fall here at, uh, at Calvary. Uh, what they do is they um, help take care of severely malnourished children and assist their families in providing the nutrition that those uh, kids need. Sometimes, these are, uh, sometimes they have physical issues that, uh, that make it hard for them to be able to eat. Uh, sometimes it's just simply the poverty of the area that makes it hard for their parents to sufficiently care for them. Um, in any event, they come to them severely malnourished, and they take care of them, and they take care of them in the name of Jesus. And so we are going to be taking an offering starting uh, next Sunday. So Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and then Easter Sunday. Um, if you would like to give during any one of those services and just simply designate that it's for the Easter Hope offering, it will go to that ministry. Also, if you go online, uh, there will be a, there's a drop-down. If you typically give online or you go on our website, there's a drop-down uh, choice for Easter Hope offering, and you can choose that there uh, as well. Uh, so those are just a couple of things that are uh, going on in the, in the life of the church. Uh, let me note at the bottom where it says Calvary Community. We believe it's important uh, for folks to gather at regular opportunities outside of the context of Sunday worship, and we do that uh, in small group community. Uh, just some specific announcements 
I believe the men's fellowship is back this, uh, this week after a couple of weeks off. I think uh, this, Sunday, uh, this Wednesday morning they'll be meeting at Mariner's Cove uh, for breakfast at 7 a.m. Uh, the Sunday night group at the McGinnis's home, there is no meeting tonight. That's uh, been previously scheduled, but uh, just as a reminder, no meeting tonight. They'll resume next Sunday evening, uh, April the, uh, the 2nd. So uh, those are some announcements. Uh, welcome. It's good to have you here. We are a, a family uh, that comes together on a weekly basis to, into God's presence to celebrate what God has done for us. And so if you're a visitor, welcome. It's great to, to have you here with us, with our family this morning. If you're a, a first-time visitor or maybe you've never picked up, uh, there are books on the cha- table called Rediscover Church. This is our gift. We want everyone who comes into our building to have a copy of this book because it explains a little bit more about what we do and why we feel this community is, uh, is, is so important. Um, if you're a visitor and uh, you picked up a bulletin and you turn to the inside, you'll see that our service is fairly easy to follow. That's why it's there. So you can kind of follow along and know what is happening. There'll be words on the screen for the uh, songs that we're singing and for the things that we're reading so that you're able to, to follow with that. Uh, we have nursery care that's available for uh, children up through three, so up through their fourth birthday. Besides that, Uh, We encourage our children to be here in worship with us uh, through the entirety of the the service. And so we provide things to help with that. There's a room in the back with a a window that makes it easier for uh, kids that might need to move around a little bit more. Uh, But we... We believe it's important, and sometimes that means that there's a little bit more noise in the room. That's what a family should expect. That's what we, that's what we are. So we're glad that you're here. Take a moment uh, before we begin and just silently pray. Ask God to be at work among us this morning uh, because you have not come here by accident. Pray that God will work in your heart and in the hearts of those around you. Psalm 130 is a song of ascent. That's what it tells us in the book of Psalms. These are songs that were sung by the people of Israel as they journeyed on their way to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts of the Lord. And I'm going to read the entirety of this Psalm 130 as our call to worship. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. You know, our English psalters, as they are called, take the Hebrew poetry of the Bible, and they turn it into English poetic meter and rhyme so that we're able to sing it. That's what we're going to do with Psalm 130. This was originally published in a Scottish free church psalter. And you'll recognize the hymn, if you are familiar at all with some Christian hymns. The the hymn, uh, the tune is, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. And we're going to sing Psalm 130. Let's stand and sing together.
look at the screen behind me or take your order of worship and see there the words that are printed for our confession of faith. We're going to read these together. These are words that are taken from a preface to a French translation of the New Testament back in the 1500s. It was a preface to that edition that was written by uh, the Swiss theologian, uh, he's actually French by birth, but most of his ministry was in Switzerland, uh, John Calvin. And it talks about the good news. We th- use this word, the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? And that's the question that this answers for us. So, church, I'll ask you and then respond to me with these words. Why do we need the gospel? Without the gospel, everything is useless and vain. Without the gospel, we are not Christians. But by the knowledge of the gospel, we are made children of God, brothers of Jesus Christ, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, heirs of God with Jesus Christ, by whom the poor are made rich, the weak strong, the fools wise, the sinner justified, the desolate comforted, the doubting sure, and slaves free. It is the power of God for the salvation of all those who believe. It follows that every good thing we could think or desire is to be found in this same Jesus Christ alone. For he was sold to buy us back, captive to deliver us, condemned to absolve us. He was made a curse for our blessing a sin offering for our righteousness, marred that we may be made fair. He died for our life. Church, this is the gospel, and this is what every Christian assents to, this good news. Now, I want to call up, and we're going to recognize this morning two of our newest members, Brian and Mary Lloyd. Brian and Mary, would you come up uh, here? Now, uh, both of those, uh, both of them have amazing stories to to tell, and I can't uh, do them justice. But Brian uh, grew up in a, uh, in a in a Methodist home, uh, but drifted away from the the faith and his faith and from any faith in, in in God, choosing to live according to his own desires, to his own rules. And at a particular low point, uh, he picked up a Bible and he picked up a book by Billy Graham, and that showed him his sin, showed him his need for a savior. Mary grew up in the Catholic Church, attended uh, Catholic school all uh, through, uh, through the, all the school years. When Brian came home with this message about Jesus, it totally transformed his, uh, her as well, and she, she too believed. And through the years, they have been faithfully uh, taught the Bible. They have faithfully attended solid churches. And then a number of years ago, they started attending, started attending Calvary. They found a home here, and they, and they stayed. But they've just, they just never joined as as members until recently. They had a growing desire to publicly and to formally identify themselves with the community of of the church, to place themselves under its accountability, and to vow to serve you and to assist you as you grow in your relationship with Jesus. And so it's exciting to me to have them up here, who they have been faithful attenders and a part of our congregation for a number of years, but now publicly saying, no, we identify with you, and we vow to serve and to assist you as you grow in your relationship with Jesus. So I'm going to ask these membership questions of Brian and Mary. These are questions that they have already answered before our elders, but now they answer them publicly before you. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving His displeasure, and without hope, save in His sovereign mercy? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? And do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? And do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? And do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for Brian, and I thank you for Mary. I thank you for the work that you did in their lives so many years ago, and I thank you for bringing them here to Calvary, to this church, to this place, to be a part of this community. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless them and use their gifts here among us, that their witness to the truth of who you are and what you have done would impact many 
impact those who are peers, to impact those who are younger and generations that need to know this hope as well. Thank you, Lord, for their faithful service. We pray that you would continue to bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. That's been memorable. (laughs) Careful going down. When someone, um, when someone puts their faith in Jesus, and then as they grow as a Christian, they look back, they look at their lives, they realize that through it all, they can claim credit for nothing. That everything that has happened to them, everything that they believe even, is all the work of God through Jesus Christ. And so that's this song that we're about to sing. It is not because of ourselves. It is through Christ in us. Let's stand and let's sing.
Our offering is not the price of admission. This is not a ticket that you purchase in order to come and worship with us. It's a free gift of God's people to the work of His church. So let's pray and let's ask that God would bless these offerings. Father, we thank You for the gift that You have given to us in Jesus. We thank You that it is not through us but through Christ working in us that we are even able to come to You and give to the work of Your church. We thank You for providing the resources for us. We thank You for giving us the ability to work, to save, in order to have money to provide for ourselves and to provide for the work of Your church. So Lord, use these things to strengthen this local community, to serve and to strengthen those ministries in our local community and missionaries around the world who proclaim the news of this Jesus, working in us and through us to bring hope to the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All through this year, we have been praying for and will continue to pray for each month one of the ministries uh, of our denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America. This is the 50th anniversary of our, the denomination in which our church is a part. And so we're praying for the different committees and agencies uh, that serve the local churches and equip them for the work uh, that we do in, uh, in local community ministry. Uh, now this, uh, this month, we're going to pray for uh, Ridge Haven. This is one of the uh, lesser known uh, agencies of the denomination. This is the Camp Conference Retreat Center of the PCA. They have two locations, one in North Carolina um, and one in, uh, in Iowa. Um, and their summer camps welcome about 4,500 campers and guests uh, each summer, serve about 50,000 meals, over 200,000 dishes they do. Um, we have a short video um, that I think we're going to try to show. It's just one minute, but it gives you just a picture of the fun that uh, kids and families have at Ridge Haven. Ridge Haven is the Camp Conference and Retreat Center of the PCA. We've got a unique opportunity to serve Christ Church, not only in the PCA denomination, but the greater church as well, through summer camps, through youth groups that come up, but also we're able to do that with lots of different Christ-based ministries. At Ridge Haven, we provide ministry to our campers, spiritually through the preaching and teaching of Christ, and the whole of Scripture. We also attempt to provide time of fun and, and games and enjoying Christ through the many different activities and opportunities we give our campers. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you for your faithfulness to Ridge Haven since its beginning in 1978, and especially in recent years through the pandemic and the uh, the, the struggles of having to shut down, but Lord, we praise you that, that they are seeing an increase in their year-round campers and the staff that allow them to serve their guests better. And we pray, Lord, that they would have a, a more sustainable workload uh, to be able to manage all of the activities that happen. And Lord, as we approach another busy summer, we pray that every camper uh, who will attend Ridge Haven would, lead, uh, would leave knowing Jesus better than when they arrived. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to provide and bring people to hear your word, uh, that you will continue to provide staff, and that in your name uh, you might be magnified above all else. God, as we come to study your word, help us to 
uh, see the God who propels people to, uh, to do things like uh, start uh, summer camps that do things uh, that, uh, that, like uh, assisting those who are in need in places like El Salvador and uh, disaster relief. Lord, help us to see in your word the God who sacrificed himself for us in the person of Jesus. And it's in that Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So our, uh, our scripture text this morning is Luke chapter 23, uh, verses 13 to 25. You're welcome to look at the screen behind me as I read this, or you can follow along on your own device, or if you want to use uh, one of the Bibles that are in the uh, the chair racks, then Luke uh, 23, 13 is on page 1123 of those Bibles. Now, we're jumping back into the trial of Jesus this morning. Uh, If you were here last week, uh, we talked about the first part of the trial, uh, the examination of Jesus by the Jewish uh, high ruling, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Is it possible to get just a little bit more volume, Jim? Thank you. So at the end of, at the end of Charles Dickens' classic novel, A Tale of Two Cities, there is a remarkable twist in the, in the plot. Now, incidentally, um, if you're in high school, right, have been to high school. Are you in high school? Some of you are in high school. Have you been to high school? Some of you have been to high school. Some of you may aspire to go to high school someday. All right, Tale of Two Cities is one of the books that I read in high school uh, that's supposed to be boring literature, right? But it's actually an action-adventure political thriller. It really is. And in this scene, toward the end of the story, at the height of the French Revolution in the late 1700s, a son of the aristocracy, a guy by the name of Charles Darnay, is arrested for crimes against the Republic. Treason. But just before his scheduled execution, his friend and his attorney, I think, actually, Sidney Carton, who looks remarkably like him, drugs him, switches clothes with him, and takes his place on death row. Right? But as he's waiting to die, he meets a poor seamstress, a young woman caught up in all the chaos of the French Revolution, who is also scheduled for execution. Now, the woman had met Charles Darnay, and she's thinking that she's talking to the real Charles Darnay, telling him all about her situation, asking if if she might be able to ride with him on the way to the, the, the guillotine. But as she's talking, and she looks a little bit more closely at him, she's looking at him, and then her face changes. First, kind of confusion, and then astonishment as she realizes that the guy who was about to die is not the real Charles Darnay. And she gazes up in amazement, and she whispers, are you dying for him? The amazement of the discovery that an innocent man will die in the place of the condemned. And what we just read, we see this on an even grander scale. And three themes come clearly into view. First theme, the unmistakable innocence of Jesus. The unavoidable responsibility of those who are involved in his trial. And the unbelievable pardon we receive as a result of what happens. Right? Three themes. They're listed for you in your bulletin if you want to follow along there. Right? Unmistakable innocence. Unavoidable responsibility. And unbelievable pardon. Now first unmistakable innocence. Jesus' trial is recorded in all four of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they all have their different emphases. And Luke does provide, at certain points, a little bit less detail about the conversations and things, say, in comparison to, like, you know, say, John. But there is one thing that Luke absolutely is trying to emphasize throughout, and that is the innocence of Jesus. It's no accident in human history that Jesus found himself on trial before a Roman court. Right? unparalleled in its time and in history up to that point, the Roman system of justice, though brutal at times, admittedly, was not barbarian mob rule. There was process. There were rules that were clearly defined. There were proceedings that were to be followed. And when Pilate says in verse 14 that his ruling is based upon his examining Jesus, that word examining is talking about a formal 
legal examination. That's what the term refers to, a formal legal examination. That's what was going on. And John, in his account, John's gospel, gives us a little bit more detail about the questioning. But Luke just jumps right to the verdict, and that is not guilty. That's what Pilate says in verse 14. Now that Jesus is back from meeting with with King Herod, Pilate says, look, we've already been over this. Back when I examined him before, I did not find this man guilty of any of the charges you brought against him. We've done this. And if you look back at last week in verse 4, that's what Pilate says. After the formal trial, he announces to the chief priests, right? Think of them as sort of the prosecutors, the chief priests. They're the prosecutors. And he announces to the crowd, this is like the gallery at the trial, and he says, verse 4, I find no guilt in this man. Now, back when he said it the first time, the Jewish leaders, they didn't like the verdict, right? So they went along with, with Pilate's idea to have Herod try him instead. It's all right, we, this is, you want to send him to Herod? Fine, we'll go to Herod. And it seems as if Herod, in his examination of Jesus, came to the very same conclusion. Now, I don't think that Herod probably felt the same sense of you know, uh, of duty to the Roman system of justice, certainly. But it seems like he agreed with the, with the Roman evaluation of the facts anyway, because at least that's what Pilate says in verse 15. He says, I didn't find Jesus guilty of anything deserving death, and neither did Herod. So, so here we are again. That's what Pilate's saying. Now, Pilate then offers his ruling again in verse 16. He says, I will therefore punish him and release him. Now, this would have been, this punishment that he's talking about here, this would have been a lighter beating compared to what one would have experienced and what Jesus would experience prior to crucifixion, right? Still not pleasant, but more like a warning to kind of stop stirring up trouble, right? Just like an admonishment. Now, it may not seem entirely fair to us, but this was common practice in the Roman system of justice to kind of do this. It's like, okay, at the very least, he's not guilty of the crimes that are being brought against him, but at the very least, he's causing problems and stuff. And so we'll just give him a, you know, a light beating sort of as a, as a warning. And we can think of it kind of like a negotiation between the judge and the prosecutors. You know, look, your capital charges, they're never going to stick. How about we just move it to like a misdemeanor and we move on from there? Right? The prosecutors, though, they don't like the deal. And so Pilate says again in verse 22, what evil has he done? I have found no guilt in this man, nothing deserving death. Now, Pilate, he ended up caving. He totally sold, as the cool people say. Right? That's what he did. We'll see that in a minute. But the most important thing for now is to notice that Jesus went to his death, rejected and condemned, and not because of any facts that proved his own guilt. And others seem to notice this as well. Right? We'll, we'll, read, we'll read this next week, later in chapter 23. But the thief, dying next to Jesus on the cross, said, we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And even further in Luke 23, Luke tells us that the Roman centurion, who was on duty at Jesus' crucifixion, after he had watched everything that had taken place, said, certainly this man was innocent. Now, that's point number one, right? The unmistakable innocence. But one observation before we move on from this. Most people do not reject Jesus based on the facts, now, some, I know, some people I know try to do. They try to do a careful analysis of the facts about Jesus, but the vast majority of people don't do a careful analysis of, of the facts about Jesus' life, the historical record, the, the evidence for the resurrection. Very few, few people would look at the trial of Jesus and say, you know, after all, I think he probably was guilty. Right? No, what they probably say with Pilate is that Jesus was, was innocent, and yet they still reject Jesus based not on the evidence, but almost in, in, in almost all instances, based on their own personal agenda. In other words, they don't believe the facts about Jesus' identity, not because they've examined the evidence, but because they don't like what the evidence might mean. And so, like Pilate, they just ignore it. Uh, Tim Keller, who spent decades in Manhattan answering objections about Jesus to, to, to young people, said that whenever he would encounter a young person from a Christian home who came home to his parents as a young adult, and this young man or woman says that they no longer believe in Jesus. Right? He says it was almost never about the evidence. Keller says the first question he would often ask a young person like this is, how long have you been sleeping with your girlfriend or with your boyfriend? Right? And, this, and this, his point was not that, 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 is, is not that people very often reject Jesus on the, on the basis of real things. It is real, but it's not on a real examination of the facts. It's not on the basis of the evidence uh, for his perfect life or his sacrificial death. 
right? They might use those things as kind of objections, but that's not really what the objection is. The objection is real, really more on their, based on their personal agenda, not on the facts of the case. And that's what was happening here, right? That's the first theme. Jesus was clearly judged to be innocent, and it seems as if almost everybody knew it, right? Even the Jewish leaders, they trumped up the charge, they kind of conspired with the crowd. They knew that they were orchestrating things. Now, they thought they had good reason for it. The reason was to protect themselves and their own level of influence. But everyone knew that he was, was innocent. And yet, this clear fact was not enough to keep Jesus from being sentenced to die. That's point number one. Now, theme number two, right? Who's responsible for this miscarriage of justice? Well, it's clear that the it's clear the Jewish leaders are, are the ones who are driving this conspiracy. That's certainly happening. They're the ones who won't accept Pilate's verdict. They keep pressing. They're the ones who stirred up the crowds. That's what it says in Mark 15. They were stirring up the crowds. And all the, Jewish, all the Jewish leaders, not just some of them, they're all implicated at one point or another. You've got the chief priests. You've got the scribes. You've got the, the whole assembly, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the, the council of the, of the Jewish leaders. Right? The religious liberals, the Sadducees, they were against Jesus. The religious conservatives, the, the Pharisees, right? they had always disliked Jesus. So clearly, the Jewish leaders, they, are, they, they bear responsibility. But it isn't just the Jewish leaders. Right? Lots of common people here, too, the crowds. And the crowds do bear some responsibility. I mean, absolutely. It's unlikely that the leaders alone could have convinced Pilate to change his mind about his verdict if there wasn't the threat of a disturbance in the background which is why the leaders riled, the, riled them up. And, and, and just because the leaders incited them and encouraged them, it doesn't mean that they're innocent in the process. Right? The, the, the mob can be whipped up by a, a charismatic leader, but ultimately, what is it about the hearts of people that can be so easily led astray by the charisma of a leader or, or so easily flow along with the peer pressure of the crowd? Right? Why did the German people close their eyes to the Holocaust even when they could see the smoke from the death camps? Right, why did so many Rwandans participate in the ethnic genocides of 1994? Why did so many professing Christians, often with really good theology in lots of other areas, pretend that the ownership and brutal treatment of Africans was somehow just some peculiar institution? Right? What keeps supposedly good men and women silent in the face of evil, or worse yet, what carries them along to actively participate in that evil? It's our own sin. And the crowds bear some of that responsibility as well, right? So they're responsible. Now, just so we're clear that the responsibility is not just with the Jewish people, remember God's historical sovereignty here, right? Jesus came when the Jewish people didn't hold ultimate political authority. The Romans did. And while Pilate may have wanted to stay out of it, the decision to execute Jesus was ultimately his decision. And whether he was convinced of Jesus' innocence or not, the Roman soldiers were the ones who acted on his command to put Jesus to death. And what Pilate was so concerned about was the opinions of, the, of, of what the local people might think of him or what Caesar might think of him if the Jewish leaders had complained to Caesar about, about how he was ruling. He was so concerned with the political expediency of it all that he just cast truth and justice to the side and he played along. This in, supposedly, the greatest system of justice of the time. No, he bears responsibility too. And so the Jews, the Romans, the leaders, the people, everyone here is implicated. And that's the point. We can't point fingers at the other person. We're all involved. None of us can run from the responsibility of Jesus' death. And this creates what, what Phil Riken calls the, the desperate dilemma on our part. Uh, we've been watching a lot of college basketball in our house the last couple of weeks, you know, March Madness and all. And, and sometimes you're watching these games, and if you don't have a rooting interest, you're not really even sure who you're rooting for. You kind of go back and forth depending on how the game's gone. Ah, I thought I was rooting for that team. Now I'm rooting for, for this team. Well, most Christians, and particularly, um, and particularly when you read this story, you kind, of, you kind of find yourself having sympathy towards Jesus. You're kind of rooting for him. He's the good guy in the story. And, and so you're reading this, and you're kind of rooting for him to get off. Right? It's understandable. After all, we've just established he's innocent of the charges. It's kind of a miscarriage of justice. And there's a part of you as you're watching the drama unfold that would just like, you know, you would really, like, you'd love the story if it kind of turned out. Like, you know, all of a sudden, what would happen if Pilate kind of manned up and said to the soldiers, no, 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 get around Jesus, protect him from the mobs. Right? You're kind of like, yeah. Like, I mean, that would be, that would be a dramatic kind of, kind of moment. Right? But Phil Riken tells a story about the time he attended one of those um, Easter drama plays 
I mean, you ever been to one of those? It's like a you know, big dramatic production of the life of Jesus and it ends with, with his death and with his resurrection. And he says that during the, the trial scene of the play, the scene that we're reading about, members of the cast c- quietly kind of slipped into the audience and they kind of sat among the audience. It was dark, people didn't notice it. But right at the moment when Pontius Pilate appeals for Jesus' release, these actors and actresses start standing up all over the theater in the midst of the audience. And they start shouting, no, crucify him. And Riken said, he said, I almost forgot it was a place. And my first instinct was to just grab one of these guys and say, sit down, be quiet. And then he said he realized two things. First, he realized that the shouting coming from the audience and not from on stage, he said, was absolutely appropriate because he too, in the audience, was responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus, his sin. And then second, he realized, as he thought about it a little bit more, that if there was any hope for him, for his sins to be forgiven, then what was about to happen was exactly what needed to happen. It was a real dilemma. Who are you rooting for? If you have a sense of justice, you're rooting for Jesus to get off, to not go to the cross. But if you have a sense of your own guilt and your own responsibility in the matter, you're kind of backed into the position of rooting for Jesus to resist the temptation to just call down the legions of angels and toast the Romans at that moment. Right? Reichen said this is where he ended up. And not because he, he desired the injustice of it all, but because he saw his own need for Jesus to go to the cross. And he said at that moment, he said to himself, yeah, if it has to be, Crucify him because I need a savior. See, when you accept your own responsibility in the condemnation of Jesus, then that's where it will lead, where it has to lead, if you have any hope of salvation. And hope is ultimately what we see in the, the third theme here, right? We see, we see Jesus' unmistakable innocence. We see our unavoidable responsibility. And finally, we see this unbelievable pardon. You may have noticed that there is no verse 17 listed in what we read. All right, if you were looking at a Bible, you kind of see it. It's like 16, 18, and you're like, wait a minute, typo? Right? Sometimes, kids, you get extra credit on your papers if you find a typo that the teacher had in there. Right? Did I, did I find a typo? Do I get extra credit? No, actually, the, the reason why it's not there is because the most reliable Greek manuscripts don't have that verse, don't have verse 17. It appears as if it was added later. Now, before you get concerned about that, verse 17 didn't say anything that the other gospel accounts don't already tell us and what Luke already assumes. It says that Pilate was obliged to release one man at the festival. In other words, there had been this, there was this custom to release one prisoner at the time of the Passover, a Passover pardon, if you will. Now, we don't know a lot more about the custom than what we read here in the Bible, but it does fit with historical precedent elsewhere that something like this might, might have happened. And it certainly fits with the Passover theme. Right? In fact, there's great amount of significance for Pontius Pilate kind of saying like, all right, this will kind of fit with the you know, Jewish culture and the religion of the time. Let's do, this at, let's do this at Passover. Because what is Passover, you remember? It's when the people of Israel were in Egypt centuries before this happened and they were saved from God's judgment because they killed a perfect lamb and they put that lamb's blood on the doorposts of their homes. And so when the angel of death came to bring judgment on the, on the land, the, 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 the angel would see that the sacrifice had been made in the place of the people in that residence and the angel would pass over that home because of the blood of the innocent lamb. Now, one way or another, Luke assumes his readers would have known about it because he just skips, the, the re, skips to the request that the people make. Release to us Barabbas, but that's the background. That's why they're able to say that. Now, who's Barabbas? Who's this guy Barabbas? Well, Luke tells us that he was in prison on death row himself, presumably, for insurrection and murder. In other words, he was a rebel who had started an uprising and killed someone, probably a Roman, in the process of this uprising. And just like there was no real dispute about Jesus' innocence, there doesn't seem to be any dispute here about Barabbas' guilt. And yet the crowds want Pilate to release to us Barabbas. And here's where the significance of this happening happening at Passover becomes profound, right? The guilty one, Barabbas, will be spared the righteous judgment of God because the blood of Jesus, the one who John called the Lamb of God, because the the blood of Jesus will be spilled. Because Jesus' death will be in the place of Barabbas's. Now, some of you might say, that seems kind of harsh. 
You might say, I mean, okay, it's cool, right? Barabbas is guilty, he's shown mercy, but did Jesus really have to die too? Is that really how it had to work? I mean, couldn't Barabbas get a second chance and Jesus be freed also? But see, that's not how justice works. It's not how justice works. Uh, many of you know that I love um, uh, Victor Hugo's uh, famous story, Les Miserables. I don't know, maybe it's the uprisings and the, 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 the riots in Paris this past week, the tale of two cities, Les Miserables. Like, I'm in sort of French insurrection mode this morning, right? But in Les Miserables, Right? And if you've been along, around long enough, you know, right? I can't, come, I can't help but come, keep coming back to this story. Now, usually I'm picking on the character Javert, right? Because he's the, he's the antagonist. He's sort of the bad guy in the story. He's the buttoned up, stern police officer who just can't leave the main character, Jean Valjean, alone, who chases him without mercy. And it's true, right? That is a Javert is this picture of cold justice and we all wish when we when we watch the musical or we watch one of the mu movie adaptations or if someone somewhere reads the really long book we all wish that Javert would just give up and just leave Valjean alone just leave him alone but you know just think about this for a second let's point out what Javert got right in this pursuit of Valjean because Valjean though he had reformed himself right he was after all still the guilty one he was the convict after all. He was the one who had broken his parole. Not just broken the law originally, but had broken his parole, changed his identity, who was on the run. He was the fugitive, and he was guilty of those crimes. Now, at the very end of the story, when Javert finally has Valjean arrested again, after all those years, this is the point. He actually does have justice on his side. And so when you finally reach this very powerful scene when he releases Valjean, and my favorite version of it is still the Liam Neeson, Jeffrey Rush movie version from 1998, right? And in, the, in this very climactic scene, in the, and it particularly comes out in, the, in this movie, right? Javert gets one very important thing right. He understands almost nothing about divine grace. But he does know this, and he knows this absolutely correctly. Grace to be grace cannot be free. Someone has to pay the price. Which is why... In the scene that the 1998 movie version, you know, the way they do it, it, why it's so powerful, right? Javert takes Valjean to the edge of the, the River Seine in Paris. And Valjean, and, and Valjean is, is, is shackled, he's handcuffed. And he probably thinks that Javert is going to push him into the river and kill him. He'll drown because his hands are shackled, right? But he doesn't. What Javert does, and it's, it, it, it's a shocking moment, it's, it's almost unbelievable. Javert takes the shackles off of Valjean. And he doesn't just throw him to the ground and tell Valjean to go. He puts the shackles on himself. And then he falls backward into the river to his own death. And after Javert does that, it all happens so fast, Valjean looks down at his arms and he's, he's shocked. And this look of puzzlement turns to this absolute look of relief, of complete joy, because now he finally realizes he's free. And can you imagine... For a second, the conversation the guards must have had with Barabbas. Right? Think about this. When they go to get him in the holding cell. Now, I'm just imagining here, but think about it, right? right? Hey, Barabbas, come here. Come here for a second. Yeah. Uh, you're free. You can go. Now, imagine his response. Wait, what? All right, what happened? This is a trick, right? Right? You're just going to stab me as I run out the door. Right? No. You're good. You're free. And maybe Barabbas knew about the Passover pardon tradition, right? Maybe he said, oh, wait, wait, I get it. I know what happened. Pilate showed mercy on me because of the Passover. Is that what happened? Pilate had favor for me. And the guards would have probably laughed and said, no, actually, actually they wanted to re he wanted to release someone else. And it wasn't you. So what happened then, Barabbas might have asked. And the guards would have said, well, th that, that's that guy, the one he wanted to release, that guy's going to die instead and, and you're going to be free. And see, and that's where the decision point comes. Right? Here's where it becomes very personal for all of us. If you were Barabbas and you know you're guilty and you hear this good news that someone else has gone to die in your place, right? two things could have happened. Barabbas could have said, cool, whatever, stinks for him, but hey, I'm back. Or... Or, on the other hand, when Barabbas learned that another man was dying in his place, he could have been struck with amazement and asked the guards, who is he? Who is this man who is dying instead of me? And the guard might have responded, I don't know. His name's Jesus. 
I think that means savior or something in your language. And indeed it does. And indeed he is a savior. And that's how he accomplishes it. And what's remarkable is that in this case, Jesus is not dying for his friend. In, in, in A Tale of Two Cities, Sidney Carton takes the place of Charles Darnay, and that's noble, but they're friends, remember. Carton feels like he's repaying a debt of sorts to, to Darnay, like, you know, he's helping out a good guy. And that's noble, but the sacrifice of Jesus is way better than that. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 5 that perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die, but God showed his love for us in this, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were his enemies, Romans 5 tells us. Isaac Watts wrote, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Right? Who is it that changed places with you? so that you can go free, so that you can experience the Passover pardon. His name is Jesus. It means Savior. And that's what kind of Savior he is. What a name. Right? From the song that we're going to sing in a, in a minute. In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Do you hear the amazement? Do you hear the wonder? Have you experienced that? Have you experienced that amazement and wonder? If you haven't experienced that, then I would, I, would, I would venture to say that perhaps you haven't experienced the Passover pardon. Right? You may have heard about the sacrifice of Jesus. It may have sounded noble, and you may have thought it's a really cool story. But if you haven't really been amazed by it, because, because you haven't really realized that your sin is what caused this man's death, if you haven't come to terms with the fact that it's your voice in the crowd demanding his execution. I haven't realized that you actually need him to die in your place if you want to go eternally free. But today you've heard it. I don't know if Barabbas heard any of the details about Jesus. I just made that conversation up, right? But you've heard it. How will you respond, right? Will you just go about your business, right? Will you just be inspired for a moment, or will you fall down on your knees in faith and put your life into the hands of this Jesus and cry out, hallelujah, what a savior. Now, maybe you've done that already. Maybe recognizing this about Jesus is something you did years ago. What's in this for you? Well, here's the thing. If you have put your life into the hands of this Jesus, this Jesus who died, this savior, then remember that what that means is what we just sang a couple minutes ago. This Jesus will never leave you. He will never forsake you. I already told you that the analogy isn't perfect, but back to that poor seamstress in A Tale of Two Cities on death row who, she, who, who meets who she thinks is Charles Darnay and finds out that it's really not. Right? She asks if she might ride with him in the cart on the way to the, the execution. She says, I'm little, I'm weak. It'll give me courage. And then when she realizes that this man she's talking to is not really Charles Darnay, but it's Charles Darnay's savior, and when she whispers in astonishment, are you dying for him? Right Then, that's when she says to him, now with a whole different look, oh, you will let me hold your brave hand, won't you? And she hears the gentle response of the noble Savior who says to her, hush my poor sister to the last. If you have bowed before this Jesus, then when this world gets scary, this is the brave hand that grasps a hold of ours and will not let go. This is the Savior who stood in our place and took the condemnation we deserved. This is the one who quiets our fears and promises to hold us to the last. Let's pray. Father, we can never thank you enough for what you have done for us through Jesus through the sacrifice that he has made. Lord, I pray that you would change our hearts, that you would give us that astonishment and wonder at what you have done, that we would consider our sin and not be crushed by it, but be amazed by a God who would pay the penalty for us and put our faith in that God. Lord, we pray these things and we pray them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus in his trial took our place took our place as the condemned, bearing 
Our shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed his pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Let's stand and let's sing. to greet someone around you as you leave, but when you go, go with God's blessing. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God.